Good morning, ma. Good morning. Yes, ma. How are you, ma? How's your health, ma? Yeah, fine now. I was not well for three days, but now I'm perfectly fine. Thank you so much for asking. Okay, we thank God for your health, ma. Amen. Thank you. Yes. So, yes, good morning to all of you who are here as well. Okay, so um, we had stopped with first and second chronicles. So today we would be looking at Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, now, um, even as we are doing Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, it would help if you can look at the list of the kings who are involved you know, during the events which take place in Ezra and Nehemiah. So in your graph, ABC notes, if you were to go to page Three, uh, where you have a list of the Persian kings, you know, who ruled during that time. And if we were to keep that you know, uh, open in front of us, it would help us to follow what happened during which particular king's reign. Okay, so that's basically what we would be getting into today. So let's start with an introduction. Um, Isaiah and Jeremiah and the other prophets warned the people of Judah again and again that in the same way northern Israel had been punished by the Assyrians, the Lord would also punish the people of Judah if they continued in their sinfulness. So he warned them again and again and told them the same fate which you know, befell the north Israel people. The same thing will happen to you. No, no, we, we, are, we are not getting you, please. We are not getting you clear. There is quite a bit of echo. Oh my, is that so? Uh, can anyone help over here regarding that? Anyone connected to the IT, please? Because uh, they are unable to hear clearly and most of the class will be lost in that. Please. Yes, the, the, the sound is not clear. It's not clear here, yeah, man. Will this help? Um, is it clearer now without the echo? Hopefully. Yes, perfect. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, that's a relief. <laughs> so, yes, um, as I was saying, uh, the Lord warned uh, through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, through many of the prophets, that there would be punishment coming upon the people of Judah if they continued in their sinfulness, if they continued in their idolatry. But the people refused to. The, the power, power is gone, is it? So, um, am I still audible online? Uh, because there's no power supply here. Yes, you are audible. Very well audible now. Perfect. Fine. In that case, I'll, I'll just continue. Uh, I'll just speak louder for the students over here. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, as I was saying for the third or the fourth time, uh, the Lord said that he would punish the people of Judah if they continue in their idolatry. And when the people would not listen, the Babylonians are allowed to come and attack them and take them away as slaves. And the Lord speaks to through Jeremiah and tells them that you will be in captivity over there in Babylon for 70 years. But the Lord makes a promise and says, yes, even though uh, I will take you away into captivity, I will bring you back to your homeland one day. And the Lord also says, I will punish these Babylonians for what they have done to you. So that is what we see happening. 66 years after the people have of uh, Judah have been taken into exile to Babylon, 66 years later, the Babylonians fall. God allows Cyrus to gain more and more power till he is in such a position where he overthrows the entire Babylonian empire and he establishes the Persian rule over the entire Middle Eastern region. So what God promised, God does. So even though God permitted Babylon to come and attack and punish his people by taking them away, 
just as he promised the day comes when in 6 uh, in 539 bc cyrus he is able to come and defeat this babylonians and he establishes persian rule and in isaiah we see the lord saying i will raise up for myself uh, you know a, a a servant who will deliver my people so the lord uses this cyrus uh, to give an order which will allow the israelites to come back to their homeland and um, this is basically how it takes place when cyrus makes this decision to send the israelites back to their homeland he's not doing it out of any godly reasons it's not due to any love that he has for the israelite people it's a political policy which he undertakes because he notices that in the previous two empires we you know which ruled over the middle eastern region the international policy which they had adopted didn't quite work because the assyrians and then later the babylonians their policy is that they're going to take the people whom they have conquered away from their homeland and put them in other places in the hope that these people will forget their identity they will forget who they are as a people and they will start calling themselves assyrians or they'll start calling themselves babylonians but cyrus notices that this doesn't really work i mean people have deep memories they love their homeland they love uh, what they regard as their own place and their culture and they will not forget it that easily so cyrus realizes this policy of displacing the people taking them away somewhere else is not really helping at all in fact it weakens the empire the people who have been replaced resent what has been done to them they do not like being taken away and put in another place so cyrus decides when he comes into power he is going to allow all the peoples not just the israelites he is going to allow all the people groups to go back to their own respective homelands so this is just a political strategy which cyrus uses but the lord plans the strategy even before cyrus is born the lord moves his heart to undertake this particular policy so that his people the israelites will be able to come back to their home so look at the way the lord moves the hearts of those even in highest power even before they are born the lord determines how he is going to use them to fulfill his own sovereign divine purposes so which is a great encouragement for us you know in these end times where the church is facing a lot of persecution at the hands of powerful people the lord who is in full control knows how he will use these powers in his own way to fulfill his purposes which can never ever be defeated so we can have that full confidence that the lord who is king of kings and lord of lords is in charge of even this powerful people who may be working against the church who may be working against the people of god the lord will use them to fulfill his plans in his perfect timing so when we look at this chart we see that cyrus is the first persian king you know he has he has started what is called the achaemenid dynasty and during his time we see the first three chapters of ezra taking place so after he gives his decree that the people can return back the jews jewish people while the people were living the israelites were living in babylon they began to be known as the yahudis as the jews you know in english we use the word j e w s so that is when they they acquire this new term up to that time they were always known as the israelites but now due while they were living in babylon a new term was given to them because they spoke the hebrew language they began to be known as the yahudis they were they came to be known as uh, the judahites or you know um, as it says in english the jewish people so once cyrus gives his decree for them to be uh, to return back to their homeland uh, we learn that 50000 jews come back lakhs of uh, israelites go or go over there you know lakhs of people from uh, the land of juda go over there into exile but when it's come when they have to come back only 50000 come back a very very small number compared to the number of people who went why 
because while they were living in exile the lord promised you know i have a future and a plan for you that's what the lord says in jeremiah he says i will take you into exile you will be punished but even when you are living over there i still have a future and a hope for you so set up your homes you know start uh, sowing crops over there i will bless you i will prosper you even in your time of exile and so now the people are so comfortable living abroad that they don't want to come back to their homeland many of them choose not to return back so it's only 50000 in the first batch who come back along with zerubbabel who has been appointed as the local governor of judea so along with zerubbabel and with joshua the high priest uh, these 50000 jews come back to the homeland they come back to jerusalem and then the locals do not like it because while they, while they were not here in their absence in this entire mediterranean region you have um, the people who have been brought from other places and placed over there they have become uh, powerful you know they are now the people in power in this area they don't want this uh, jewish people coming back and retaking the power and so they begin to oppose the returnees who have come back home so these people who have come back this 50000 they come back with a passion for god they are grateful that they have returned to their homeland they want to immediately start rebuilding the temple they want to honor the lord but there is opposition being faced if in ezra chapter 3 um if we, if um you could maybe read out for us verses 2 and 3 Let's see what it says over here. Ezra chapter three, verses two and three, please. Then stood up Joshua, the son of Jehoiada, and his brethren, uh, the priest, and the Jerubbaba, Jerubbab, Jerubbabel, uh, the son of uh, the son of Stelthel, and his brethren, they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer the burnt offering. they they run as it is written in the law of moses the men of god and they set the altar upon the basis for the fear and was upon them because the because of the people of those countries and those who offered the burnt offering they run upon the lord even burnt offering morning and evening um in the simpler english of niv it says though fear had come upon the people because of the people of those countries they set the altar on its basis and they offered burnt offerings so they were scared they were scared of the opposition which they are facing from all the locals who have now taken over that region so in spite of the fear in spite of the opposition because of their love for god they want to begin honoring him again and so 7 months after they come back they start the reconstruction work of the temple they reestablish the altar and they begin to offer burnt offerings every morning and every evening just as moses had commanded them so within 7 months of of coming back they start the reconstruction work they first build the altar so that they can start making offerings to the lord and then slowly they begin uh, digging the foundations so that they can they can you know lay the foundation for the temple so 14 months after coming back the foundation is finally completed uh, the building has not yet come up but the foundation for the temple has been laid so 7 months after coming back the altar is built 14 months after coming back the entire foundation is laid out and we have a description of that in uh, ezra chapter 3 where it says um maybe we could um, read out verses 11 and 12 um yeah uh, cha- ezra chapter 3 verses 11 and 12 if someone could read out and they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever towards israel and all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the lord because the foundation of the house of the lord was laid but many of the priests and levites and the chief the chief of the fathers who were the ancient men that had seen the first house 
when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, we with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. And it says in the 13th verse that you had a mixture of sounds. Some are shouting with joy and some are weeping loudly. So it says in uh, verse 13, in fact, the noise of the shout of joy uh, could not be discerned from the noise of the weeping of the people. Why are some people and, and why are some people weeping and why are some people joyful? Because among this crowd of 50,000 which has come back, there are some very, very old people, people who were still alive at the time of Jeremiah before you know they were taken away into exile. So they have gone to the temple of Solomon. They have stood over there and seen the grandeur of that entire place. So they have memories. And now when they look at the simple foundation which has been laid in the middle of so much opposition and difficulty, they feel sad. They think about the glorious times which they remember from their past. And to them, this foundation looks very simple. It doesn't look as wonderful as you know, uh, the previous one did. And uh, so while some are rejoicing and you know, expressing joy that finally, in spite of the difficulties, they have laid the foundation, there are others who are weeping and mourning that the grandeur of the previous temple has been lost. So under these circumstances, we see the foundation of the temple being laid. One thing to I know, remember, um, this foundation which was laid, and then the temple which came out, you know, the building which was constructed on top of this foundation. Uh, later on, when Herod, who is not even an Israelite, you know, wants to bribe the people into making him king, he promises that he'll make them a very grand temple of the Lord. So this basic um, foundation and the central, you know, the holy, holy place and the most holy place, they are not touched. But around this entire uh, thing, he builds other grand buildings and he builds porches. Uh, you know, he builds colonnades. He does all that to make the entire place look very grand until it becomes like a huge temple complex. But this central thing, you know, which these people built in their time of difficulty, that stays. It stays on even into the time of Herod. And the people who are crying and saying, oh, this is not as glorious as the you know, Solomonic temple, how wrong they were. Because it is in this temple that Jesus walks, not in the Solomonic temple. So you literally have the uh, Yahweh in human form, you know, in all of his divinity, literally coming down and physically walking in the premises of this temple. So in fact, actually, whether those people realized it or not, the glory of this current temple, this insignificant temple in their eyes, was much more glorious than the previous Solomonic temple. You know, that's something that we uh, get to know about later. So, um, so now, once the foundation is laid, the people are very encouraged that they were able to achieve this, that God has been able to do this for them in maybe one and a half years' time. And so now they are eager to start the actual building construction work on top of the foundation. So that you will find in the first five verses of Ezra chapter 4. Uh, the people start doing the construction work. And when they start doing that, the locals who have been watching are very upset. You know, they try to uh, do all kinds of things to stop the people from doing the con temple construction. And now they see that the foundation has been laid and the people have rejoiced, the people have made sacrifices. And so now they decide to change their tactics. So now they come to the Jewish people and they say, you know what, we want to partner with you. So allow us to participate along with you in doing this temple construction work. Maybe their hidden agenda was that, you know, they would try to hamper and distract and stop the work. Don't know with what uh, intentions they offered to partner. And then Zerubbabel very plainly says, no, we don't want to partner with you in any way. Why does Zerubbabel refuse a partnership? We get to know about it. Um, if we were to go back to 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 24 to 41. 
So when you go back to Second Kings chapter 17, verses 24 to 41, then you get to know who are these people who are coming forward to offer their partnership. These are all the people who have been resettled in the land, you know, from the Assyrian time. And who are they? They are people from Babylon, from Kutta, from Ava, from Hamath, from Sepharvaim. These are people from all kinds of pagan backgrounds. So in 2 Kings chapter 17, you get to know that after they come and settle over here in this entire region, you know, they continue to follow their own pagan practices. They continue to worship their own pagan gods. And at that time, Yahweh is angry that these people have come into his territory and they are worshipping their pagan gods. And it says over there in the Second Kings chapter 17 passage that the Lord sent lions among them and many of the people began to die. And at that time, the people say, my goodness, the God of this region is not happy with us. We need to start worshipping him. And so they request the officials and they say, please send us somebody who will teach us the ways of the God of this region. And so a priest is sent to them at that time and he instructs them in the ways of the Lord, you know, in the ways of the living God. However, this is what we see in 2 Kings chapter 17. Uh, verse 29, if someone could, uh, 29 to 33, if someone could read out. Second Kings 17, verses 29 to 33, please. How it? Every nation made gods of their own and put them into the in the houses of the high places, which the Samaritan had made every nation in the cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon made Shokat, Benoth, and the men of Cut made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Asimya, and the Avites made Nibhat and Rathak, and the Sebarwites Seba burnt their children in fire to Adaramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sebarawayan. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priest of the high places which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations who they carried away from thence. There's a long list of all the idols which they continued to practice. But then verse 33, it says they feared Yahweh. So this was not a genuine fear of Yahweh. From the priest who taught them about the ways of Yahweh, they learned a little bit about uh, the true faith. But they mixed it along with their pagan practices and they continued to practice their pagan you know, uh, systems. They did not give up those things. So what they did was they brought in something which is called syncretism. That's basically a technical term which means you take the true faith and you mix it along with other pagan faiths and you come up with a new version. So which is what these people did. So Zerubbabel says, we will not partner with people like this. People who are showing, who through, you know, in their, through their lips, they say that they are worshipping the living God. Because that is what they say to Zerubbabel in Ezra chapter 4, uh, verse 2. These people, they say to, uh, uh, to Zerubbabel in Ezra chapter 4, verse 2, they say, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esar had dawn. But the truth is that even though they were sacrificing to Yahweh, their hearts were still with their idols. And Zerubbabel says, no, we will not have any kind of partnership with you people. And because of the stand which Zerubbabel takes, therefore, the people, they, you know, they, they all turn against the Israelites and they start creating problems for them. So in Ezra chapter 4, verses 4 to 5, it says, that they bribe the officials so that the officials will not allow the Jewish people to continue the construction work. And so they literally force the construction work to stop. So after the time of Cyrus, during the time of the next two kings, Cambyses and Smerdis, who are there in that, you know, in, the, in that table, during the time of Cambyses and Smerdis, there's a lot of opposition which takes place. And the temple work comes to a standstill. 
and it's only during the next rule of Darius that we see a change in circumstances. A lot of things happened during the time of Darius. Um, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, the Lord comes to a person named Haggai, you know, who has come back along with the rest of the people. He's a prophet. The Lord comes to him and says, I want you to start talking to the people and I want you to urge the people to kindly start the reconstruction work. Because, you know, so, so Haggai begins to preach and that is basically what you find in the book of Haggai. Haggai speaks to the people and he says, you people are living comfortably in your homes and you're not even bothering to rebuild the temple. How much longer are you going to wait? And then the conscience of the people is pricked and immediately they start, you know, the reconstruction work after having stopped for 17 years. For 17 years, the temple construction work is stopped. And then when Haggai urges them and starts preaching to them, and we have his words recorded in the book of Haggai, then when he begins to encourage them, the people begin to rebuild. And about three months later, the Lord comes to a person named um, Zechariah. And through Zechariah, the Lord speaks to the people and he says, you must, you know, the priests must take their duties seriously. They must start being spiritual leaders to the people and start teaching them the law of Moses so that they will be faithful in following the Lord. So the Lord uses Haggai and Zechariah to stir up the people after 17 year gap to restart the construction work. And then the governor of that entire trans Euphrates region, a man named Tatanai, when he gets to know that the construction work has restarted, he immediately sends a letter to Darius saying, these people have restarted the work. So what should we do about it? And then Darius goes through the old records of his ancestor Cyrus, and he gets to know that official permission was granted to the people to rebuild. And so he says a letter to them saying, they actually have official permission, kindly allow them to continue with their construction work. And so in three years time, 20 years, you know, after uh, the work actually started, now finally in 516 BC, the second temple construction work is completed. So um, we have these four kings, you know, Cyrus, during whose time the construction work begins. Then you have Cambyses and Smyrdas, during whose time the work is stopped. And then in the time of Darius, the work of the temple construction is completed. So in Ezra chapter 4, there is one small portion which talks about events which take place later, after the time of Darius, after the uh, no, completion of the temple construction work. That would be Ephesians, um, geez, sorry, Ezra, sorry, Ezra chapter 4, verses 6 to 23. Okay, so Ezra chapter 4 verses 6 to 23 is like a small parenthesis. It's been put over there to talk about later events. Because if you look at Ezra chapter 4, 4 verse 24, it again begins to talk about the temple construction work. But in between, in that small portion, Ezra 4, 6 to 23, it talks about later events which take place after the death of Darius. So if you were to look in your table, you know, after Darius, who's the next king? You, uh, this, it's a person named Zeres. He's the next king. And Zeres has a very anti-Jewish policy. So during the time of Zeres, um, the people are so happy that the temple construction work is finally finished. Now they have a fully functional temple. And now, uh, you know, all the worship is going on. So now the people want to start rebuilding the city, you know, to make things better, to rebuild the walls, uh, to, to repair all the gaps which are there in the walls of Jerusalem. So they start doing this in the time of Zeres. And immediately the locals, they send a letter to Zeres saying, these people have started rebuilding the walls. If they rebuild the walls and they become an independent city, they will no longer pay any taxes to you. And then you will be at a loss. 
and so they write to zerus saying you are the one who will be harmed if you allow these people to start repairing and rebuilding jerusalem and so zerus is very upset when he reads that letter you know you find details of all of this in ezra chapter 4 verse 6 onwards so ezra 4 Six or verse six onwards is talking about events which take place after the death of Darius. So um, Zerus writes back to the people, say uh, to to these you know to these locals, saying, "Do not allow the Jewish people to rebuild Jerusalem." Uh, this is what he says in Ezra chapter four. Um, maybe we can look at verses eighteen, nineteen. Yeah, Ezra four. If someone could read out eighteen and nineteen, please. The letter which he sent unto us has been uh, plainly read before me, and I commanded, and search has been made, and it is found that this city of old time has made in insurrection against kings. All right. So we see over here in uh, the, so the king replies back to the locals and saying, "Thank you for informing me. You know that these people are doing this. And yes, I have gone through the official records. I I, re I realize now that these Jewish people uh, in the past they have created all kinds of problems. They have rebelled against the most powerful kings, defeated them, taken over. So the same thing may happen even to me. So." Strictly stop them from repairing and rebuilding Jerusalem, and that is those are the strict orders which Zerus sends back. And so these people who have eagerly started rebuilding and repairing Jerusalem, they are forcibly stopped by law, by Zerus himself. And then later, maybe I mean we don't know how I mean how old Zerus was when he finally married Esther. After he marries Esther. Then his attitude towards the Jewish people changes a little bit. So Zerus was not a good person. He did not care about the people of God. It is only for Esther's sake that later, you know, in his old age, he starts being a little nice to the Jewish community. And uh, so, after Zerus, the next king who comes in the table would be Arta Zerus. And so it is Arta Zerus. Because of the kind of favorable policy which is now prevailing towards the Jewish people, he starts showing some kindness, and so Arta Zerus, in during his lifetime, he allows Ezra to come to come back to Jerusalem with a second batch of people. So Ezra comes back in 457 BC along with 2,000 Jews. Uh, so he's he's basically coming back 59 years after the temple was. constructed okay so in the time of artazeres you have ezra coming over here along with 2000 jews about 2 years later nehemiah is also allowed to come over here and that is how we enter into the book of nehemiah we will not be able to cover all of nehemiah today you know we will do that uh, we'll continue in the next class uh, but then we will see how much ever we can look at today so if you, you know follow that table we see that uh this temple construction work and also the restoration of jerusalem happens over a long period of time doesn't just take place instantly and god doesn't you know wave a magic wand and make everything happen uh, in a matter of a few years so the lord has his ways the people were crying out to him the people were relying upon him but the lord allows things to take place over a long period of time so the lord has his plan his schedule and he knows best he knows what to you uh, know uh, bring into fulfillment when so the people did not lose hope at least some of them continued to hold on to the lord continued to cry out to him and in his perfect time finally in the time of artazeres you know the lord allows ezra to come back with a new batch of Jews and even Nehemiah is allowed to come back, and then the restoration work really starts because the, they start, you know, becoming a solid community once again under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. But it takes many, many years to see all of this taking place. So when we enter into the um, book of Nehemiah, the temple construction, of course, is now finished, 
and um, uh, now uh, in his last years zeres shows some kindness to the people of jews uh, to, to the uh, to the people of juda because of esther's you know uh, intervention and then during the time of artaxerxes things have now improved for the jewish people so nehemiah we see is an official who is working directly under artaxerxes and uh, we get to know a little bit about his story in uh, the first chapter uh, we get to know that even as he is serving under the king uh, some people come to visit him all the way from uh, jerusalem so he talks to them you know he asks them how is the homeland how are things going on over there and then he gets to know that jerusalem is still in a bad bad condition that the walls of jerusalem are still in a broken down state and when uh, nehemiah hears about that it completely breaks his heart he if you remember is in a very powerful official position he is one of the most trusted officials of one of the most powerful kings of that time so he doesn't have to bother about his homeland you know which is somewhere out there he doesn't have to bother about its broken walls but his heart is with the people of god his heart is with the plans and purposes of god and so even though he is living in a powerful and luxurious position he wants to do something for his people so a secular man who is not in ministry who is not a priest or a prophet has such a burden for his people for his homeland that he gets down on his knees and he begins to fast and pray now what's the lesson that we can draw from this it's not just people in ministry who should be concerned about the purposes of god the plans of god the lord calls upon all his people to equally care about the things of god not just those who are in ministry and we see nehemiah expressing that kind of a love and so he begins to fast and pray and um, this is what uh you know he 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 prays it says in uh, verse 4 we have come into nehemiah chapter 1 now and if you look at verse 4 he says when i heard these things i sat down and wept for some days i mourned and fasted and prayed before the god of heaven and this is what he prays in his prayer uh if you were to look at verses 6 and 7 um this is what he says Yeah, if someone could read out those two, uh, you know, beautiful verses, Nehemiah chapter one, verses six and seven, please. Let thin ears now be attentive, and the thin eyes open, that you too may rest here the prayer of the servants, which I pray before the knee now, day and night, for the children of Israel. the servants and confess the sins of the children of israel which we have sinned against thee both i and my father house have sinned we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes uh, nor the judgments which took commands the servant moses over here nehemiah says you know he says is kneeling down before the lord and it says over here i confess the sins we israelites including myself and my father's family have committed against you you know has nehemiah uh, personally committed any sin no he is he is um, identifying himself with his people you know he says all of us together we have sinned you know he doesn't say i am not like all the other jewish people you know i have maintained myself in a godly manner which is why god has lifted me up and now i'm an important official in a very important position that's not the attitude he takes he identifies with his, the rest of his people and he says lord we have sinned because of what we have done jerusalem is in this condition so lord please forgive us that is intercessory prayer where you know you don't stand on a height and say lord i'm better than all the others but lord those other uh, christians look at the condition they are in lord please help them no he identifies himself with the others and he says lord we together 
you know when when something happens to your family you, you're not like you know oh good my family is going through that but i am fine no right you automatically identify with your family whatever they are going through you are going through when they are going through pain you to feel the same pain in the same way so here we see nehemiah um um making himself one with his people and he says lord we have sinned and lord we want you to forgive us so that jerusalem may be restored once again so he says in verse 11 lord let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and he says i want to take up this matter with the king so when i talk to the king about this lord please give him a good heart you know don't let him get angry because the king will obviously want to talk about persian matters he's not going to be interested in talking about some you know you know some jewish matter you know about jerusalem so he says lord please give the king a good heart when i go to the king with my request and then we move into chapter 2 so in chapter 2 we see that nehemiah now comes to the king and he is having a very sad face um maybe we can actually have someone read out those verses so chapter 2 if someone could read out verses 1 and 2 nehemiah 2 1 and 2 and it come to the pass in the mount sinai in the 12th year of arkeres the king that the wine was before him and i took up the wine and gave it unto the king now i had not been the before times sad in his presence where wherefore the king said unto me why is the countenance sad seeing to ark not sick this is nothing else but sorrow of heart then i was very sorrow afraid it says over there in verse at the end of verse 2 i was very much afraid why was nehemiah so afraid to have a sad face i mean don't we all have a right to you know have a sad face once in a while why was nehemiah so afraid because these powerful emperors you know considered themselves uh, almost gods so they wanted only cheerful faces in front of them nobody had a right to even express their actual emotions in front of the emperor so whether they are happy or unhappy they would have to put on a good face in front of the king and act like as if everything is perfectly fine because uh, you know the emperor should be in a good mood so he does not want to see any sad faces around him i mean imagine the arrogance of those emperors you know and how powerful they were back then where they can control a person's life if you come to the king with a sad face he can have you killed you know he'll say i don't want to have a sad face in front of me so you know let him be killed so nehemiah was actually afraid for his life when he comes over there because he's in deep mourning his heart is broken for jerusalem and he's unable to put on a happy face and then the king notices that and the king says why does your face look so sad when you are not ill and when he says that nehemiah gets very very afraid but you know he he says in verse 4 then i prayed to the god of heaven and i answered the king so he quickly sends a prayer to the lord saying lord please help me and he opens his mouth and starts talking to the king he tells the king about the condition in which jerusalem is he talks about how the walls are in a broken state and then he says please can i go and do something about it i mean imagine he's an official duty over here with one of the most powerful kings and he wants he's asking for leave personal leave to go away and do something for jerusalem so what would the king's response basically be you know he would say i'm not paying you money over here to go somewhere else and do some other work so this actually danger in the request which uh, nehemiah is placing and moreover the king asks you know this is what we see in chapter 2 verse 6 it says then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me how long will your journey take and when will you get back so nehemiah is not planning on going for one week is not planning on going for one month because construction work is going to take a long time he is going to be asking for leave for a very very long time so this is a very crucial question which is being asked over here but you know he has made up his mind that he will serve the lord and do what 
whatever it requires. And so he must have honestly told, you know, uh, the king how much time will be required for him to go over there and do the work which is needed. And uh, so it's just a miracle that Atazeras actually allows his most important official to go away on a very, very long leave to Jerusalem to help in rebuilding the Jerusalem walls. So we see the hand of God in all of this. There was no need for Atazeras to give him permission. Atazeras could, in fact, have had him killed or, in fact, had him fired. You know, if he doesn't want to kill him, at least he could have had him fired from the job. But he gives Nehemiah a new official position. He says, you don't have to just go there on leave. You can go there as the new governor of that region. So he's officially appointed as the governor of uh, you know, the Judean region. And he is sent back with official authority to rebuild and repair Jerusalem. So we see the hand of God in, uh, you know, in, in, in orchestrate. When Nehemiah comes back, uh, the first thing which we see when he returns back, you know, during the night time, he makes a round of the entire walls to see what condition the place is in. And it must have been a very sad thing for him to see, you know, the walls broken down in so many places. You know, anyone can come inside the city and attack and they, there's no way the people will be able to defend themselves. So he looks at all of that. And even as he's going around that entire you know, wall, he must have been praying in his heart and you know, saying, Lord, show me how I can restore all of this. Show me who are the people who will stand by me even as I do all of this. So a secular man who was not even in ministry is, takes on this role because of the burden that he carries in his heart. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, how much burden do we have for the kingdom of God, for the purposes of God, for the people of God? You know, we may be in high positions in the secular field. We may be earning enough and we may be financially secure. So in spite of all of the worldly comforts, what burden do we carry for the kingdom of God and for the purposes of God? Here we see... Nehemiah, you know, laying a very high standard for all of us, you know, regarding the regarding this matter. And one thing that we, you know, we see about Nehemiah when he becomes governor, um, this is something which he talks about uh, later on. Um, I think in Nehemiah chapter 13, where he talks about how he conducted himself as a governor. Um, in uh, Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 14 uh, and 15 this is what he says that in the, you know during his entire time as a governor he does not take advantage of the people or ask them for the taxes which they should pay him personally uh, in uh, nehemiah 14 verse 15 this is what uh, sorry nehemiah 13 yeah nehemiah chapter 13 um Verse 15, he says, the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. But then he says, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. And so instead of taking taxes from the people to support him and his luxurious lifestyle, he in fact gives from his pocket to the people to help them to feed them. That is the kind of governorship that he, you know, um, uh, takes on. So he, in fact, sets a people to, uh, sets, sets an example to all the other leaders of that region about how a godly leader should live. So next class, we look at a few more details regarding Nehemiah, you know, which we could not cover today. But this is the kind of man that we see uh, in this uh, particular book. So, um, yeah, let's just quickly close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the things that you have taught us through your word uh, from the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, we see, O oh Lord, that your hand is all powerful. When you plan and purpose to do something, nothing and no one can stop you. Not even the most powerful forces can thwart your plans, O oh Lord. 
so lord we thank you that we are under the protection and care of this kind of an almighty god so o oh lord we place our church our uh, situations uh, our the the our ministries all of it o oh lord in your hands your all powerful hands it really does not matter o oh lord what kind of forces are working against us because you are king of kings you will cause everything to succeed in your perfect time so lord we look to you with that confidence which we which we find from the book of ezra and we pray oh lord that we would be like nehemiah who was completely sold out for the things of god he didn't care about his material position he was more interested in doing something for you and we pray that we would emulate his example in our own lives thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you